lost the screen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, I'm sorry yeah. I was trying to go live yeah, on yeah, YouTube. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're here now, Maharaj. I'm sorry for that. Okay, Dharma Pavona Rupa Tim Satu Samrad Vihat Chervaham Saksa Maha Bhagavato Raju Sirhaya Medaya Sutrit Shrama Yuto Dino Naravamach Japam Arhati Translation The Emperor Parikshit is a pious king. He is highly celebrated and is a first class devotee of the personality of Godhead. He is a saint among royalty and he has performed many horse sacrifices. When such a king is tired and fatigued, being stricken with hunger and thirst, he does not all deserve to be cursed. After explaining the general codes related to the royal position, asserting that the king can do no wrong and therefore is never to be condemned to sage Samika, Samika wanted to say something about Emperor Parikshit specifically. Specific qualifications of Maharaj Parikshit is summarized herein. The king, even calculated as a king only, was most celebrated as a ruler who administered the religious principles of the royal order. In the Shastras, the duty of all castes and orders of society are described. All the qualities of the Shatras mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita were present in the person of the emperor, who was also a great devotee of the Lord and was a self-realized soul. Cursing such a king when he was tired and fatigued with hunger and thirst was not at all proper. Samaka Rish was thus, thus admitted from all sides that Maharaj Parikshit was cursed most unjustly. Although all the Brahmins were aloof from the incident, still for the childish action of a Brahmin boy, the whole world situation was changed. Thus, Sri Shu Samaka Brahmana took responsible for all deterioration of the good orders of the world. Namaste, sirs, but be day, they go to Vani to Chari, they never say, Sunya Vari, was yet your days to turn a bunch of copa to this cha. He passed in the way, but cha, but he can't own Pavane Bio, Vaishnava Bio, Mahona Mahajas and Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadad Har, Sivas and Gaur, Bakhavindam. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hmm. So a Brahmin boy, because he had Brahmin Tejas, a Brahminical power, he used, he misused his power. And here we see from this incident that the whole collapse of the Brahminical culture was simply ministered by this you know, boy who used his powers in the wrong way. The Brahminical class is meant to lead the uh, society by giving both spiritual and uh, practical advice on how to live life according to scripture and according to the principles of the mode of goodness. When the Brahmins become proud of their position and lose their connection with righteousness, then they act against higher principles. And here's an example. And as Prabhupada points out in the purport, this was the beginning of the whole downfall of the Brahminical culture. Without Brahminical culture, society is deficient. Srimad Bhagavatam explains that there are three essential principles by which all 
human society should function accordingly. And if these three principles are in line, then society is not in the only progressive in the material sense, but it's also leading one back home, back to Godhead, which is the goal of life. And those three principles are mentioned in this section of the Bhagavatam. And one of those three principles is that um, Brahminical culture means acting according to the mode of goodness and guided by saintly persons. The Kshatriyas or the administrators must, uh, must be guided by higher principles. And the Kshatriyas, when they work in accordance with the, Brahm the Brahmins, then the whole society, everyone gets their personal needs taken care of. And they can also be, they can also make progress towards the path back home, back to Godhead. The second principle is to protect cows. Cows are the foundation for an economic base and also give also life-giving substance such as cow dung and milk and various other products that they produce. At the same time, the auspiciousness of the presence of the cow brings about a sense of uh, saintliness within society. So cows are very, very essential as a foundation for both material and spiritual development. And the cow is also used in, to worship the Lord by providing the ingredients that are used in the Abhishek ceremony. So cows, and of course, uh, when we can speak further about cows, we find that uh, the cows are very dear to Krishna, and Krishna's planet in the spiritual world is called Goloka, planet of the cows. So cow protection, cow care is better word, cow care, Brahminical culture, and teaching the worship of the Supreme Personality, Gandhi, which is the third principle. When these three principles are in line, then society is progressive and can move both materially successful and spiritually elevating. Here we see the, the results of a, the downfall of the Brahminical culture, which is the foundation for keeping spiritual principles intact and developing proper saintly rule within the society. So how is it possible this, this young boy, he was only 12 years old, he cursed such a powerful king for no apparent reason. Everyone who was, even his father, who was supposed to be the, the object of the offense committed by uh, Maharaj Pariksit, was also lamenting what his son had done. He didn't even agree with that. But there was a higher principle that is not mentioned here, but which is the foundation is that in order to speak the Bhagavad Gita, I'm sorry, Srimad Bhagavatam, Krishna arranged for this situation to happen. Just like he arranged for Arjuna to be put into illusion and ask questions that he would never even think of as a saintly person and as a Kshatriya. But that was also Krishna's arrangement to give the world the great text called Bhagavad Gita. Now here, in the same way, this knowledge was being disseminated through two persons. Maharaj Pariksha and Sugadeva Goswami. Obviously, the punishment was not in line with the so called offense. In fact, it was not even an offense. But, but for higher principles and Maharaj Pariksha, he had the power to counteract the curse, but he didn't do it because he, he saw this as the hand of the Supreme Lord. And therefore, he took the opportunity to retire from worldly affairs, gave up his kingdom, gave up his family connections, sat down on the banks of the Ganga, and for seven full days heard from Maharaj, I'm sorry, from Sukadev Goswami, all the way up through um, the 12 cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam. And uh, we see that. After hearing everything, he, had, he became perfectly self-realized. There was nothing else. Not only was he perfectly self-realized, he was free from all fear. 
he accepted his destiny as being the opportunity to perfect his life, leave the world and go back home, back to Godhead. When Maharaj Pariksit was just in the womb of his mother before he appeared in the world, he was protected by Krishna. So he was, uh, even when he was a young boy or even unborn, he would, they tried to kill him at that time. Asvatthama had thrown a uh, her master into the womb of Uttara, the mother of uh, Maharaj Pariksit, to kill the child. But Krishna appeared in the womb. And although the child actually was momentarily killed by the Brahmastra, Krishna brought him back to life. That's the understanding. Because he was the last or, or last heir to the throne for the Pandava for the for the uh, for the Yadava dynasty. And being the last year, Krishna preserved his life so he could rule the world. He ruled the world in such a saintly way as we read from the Srimad Bhagavatam, the first canto. But now he took the opportunity to go back home, back to Godhead. And it's interesting because um, when he was ready to meet his destiny, hearing perfectly from Sukadev Goswami, Sukadev Goswami congratulated upon his ability to become fully self-realized simply by hearing directly the message of Srimad Bhagavatam. He left and he was completely fearless. He wasn't afraid of death. And he had accepted the fact that he was not the material body and his material body would be destroyed, but he would go on to the spiritual world. When uh, he left Sukadev Goswami, he sat in meditation fully absorbed in the Supreme Lord. Toxica, who was that snake, was a mystical snake. He came to do his uh, bidding on Maharaj Pariksit. And as he was approaching, he was stopped by Kashyapa Muni. Kashyapa Muni interfered with Toxica uh, about to, to destroy Maharaj Pariksit. And uh, Toxica said to Kashyapa Muni, please don't interfere. He said, I'm here to stop you. I will preserve the life of this great king. He will reverse the curse. Uh, Toxica said, my, my poison is so powerful that it can destroy anything. You cannot counteract it. So Kashyapa challenged him to a demonstration. And Toxica let his poison out upon a Hippolyta tree and it destroyed the tree completely. But what happened was Kashyapa Muni had the power to counteract any poison. And so he brought that same tree completely back to life. When Toxica saw that, he realized that his mission was going to be thwarted. So he apparently disappeared by his mystic power and took the form of a Brahmana. And when Maharaj Pariksit was sitting in meditation there were many so persons around him and one of the persons was toxica in the form of a brahmana and then he took the opportunity to get very close to maharaj pariksit and then he turned himself into his original form as toxica the mystic's poisonous snake bird and bit the foot <laughs> of maharaj pariksit and that biting but it injected him with this deadly poison and his body immediately burst into flames and he was completely oblivious or free from any, any of the activities that was happening to his body. And then as soon as his body was destroyed, he attained perfection and went back home, back to Godhead. Of course, Janman Jaya, the father of um, Maharaj Pariksit, became very angry when he found out what had happened. So he was a very powerful king, called all the Brahmanas together. He said, now we will destroy all the snakes in the world. He said, bring about a sacrifice. And they did. And they chanted the mantras and all, of the, all the snakes were falling into this fire of sacrifice. Toxica realized what was happening. He realized his life is a threat. So he went to Indra and he went to Indra for protection. And Indra gave him protection. 
And uh, at that point, he was given protection by Indra. And then uh, Jamajaya continued his yagya to throw both Indra and Toxica and all the devas into the fire. <laughs> so the story goes on. After that, we haven't read any farther than that. <laughs> we'll have to find out what happened after that. But somehow or other, by the power of Indra, he was able to counteract the effects of that yogi. But a great sage came up to Jaman Jaya. I forgot who that sage was and said, uh, there's no need to kill all the snakes in the world just for one snake. So please stop the sacrifice. And he did. He did. So um, it's quite an intriguing pastime to see how it's unfolded. But the whole thing is that Maharaj Parikshit took the opportunity of a situation in this material world to relinquish all of his material uh, responsibilities and simply focus completely on the Supreme Personality of Godhead in pure meditation. We can also learn from this uh, situation that sometimes we, um, our uh, desires in, in material life are thwarted. We get reverses, or maybe we even get deadly sicknesses, or we get something very unpredictable in our life then uh, a devotee can think, oh, actually, here's an opportunity to become detached from everything material. Let me simply just use the remaining part of my life and chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, go to a holy place and perform devotional service, and then ultimately leave the world in pure Krishna consciousness. So uh, we see that um, something apparently is inauspicious, and turned into something auspicious for those involved. On another level, there is an inauspiciousness here. It's also mentioned in the purport that the Brahminical class had now become degraded. They had used their power in the wrong way. And because of that, the Brahminical class went down. And then because of that, there were so many uh, anomalies or deficiencies in the Brahminical culture. And Brahminical culture lost its influence in the world. And therefore, then the whole caste system started to arise. The caste system became a, a result of the fall of the, the, the natural Brahminical caste class. And what is the caste system? The caste system says if you're born in a Brahmin family, you're a Brahmin. If you're born in a Kshatriya family, you're a Kshatriya born in a Vaishya family, you're a Vaishya, similar with Sudras. So it became rubber stamp, where those who take birth according to a certain Varna become that Varna. But we also know that this uh, principle is against the principles of uh, qualification. A person's qualification to act according to a particular Varna is based on education and qualification, and not simply on birth. And this is brought out in the Shastras. Krishna also explains that even if one is born in a lower family, if they exhibit the qualities of a higher, uh, a higher varna, then they should be seen in that way. And if one is born in a high Brahminical family, but then they should be they should be designated that in that way. So. Um, we see how, and nowadays, even the Brahminical culture is somewhat lost due to uh, this incident that happened so many thousands of years ago. The Brahmins have now become uh, beggars and are surreptitiously taking the position of leadership without the pro proper qualifications. Prabhupada said in, in one of his lectures, the whole fall of India to the Muslim leaders of Muslim rulers were due to the uh, fall of the Brahminical class. When the Brahminical class was uh, not honoring um, the other lower classes, the other lower classes uh, left the uh, Brahminical, uh, left the, the uh, Hindu society and started to become Muslims. Papa said that's how the entire Muslim 
society developed in India. It was not brought in from the outside, it came from the inside. So yeah, without leadership, everything becomes chaotic. And people who are not leaders try to take the position of being leaders. And then you have what is called uh, topsy-turvy. And then uh, and Arjuna made that point to Krishna also that when when the uh, when uh, the leaders in society or the men in society, he made a broader statement, are killed and the women are unprotected, and then because the unprotected women will be uh, will be victimized by unscrupulous men, then you have what a class called varna sankara or those persons who are um, simply interested in exploiting women for their sense gratification. Then you have a class of unwanted children who are coming not from Brahminical sources, but from all other lower sources throughout the different universes. So um, you'll see both the benefit and the uh, downside of this particular pastime. The benefit was the speaking of the Srimad Bhagavatam. The downside was the abrogation or the, uh, uh, the, purifica uh, the putrefaction of the Brahman class. Okay, these are some principles based, centered around this particular. And we see how Shama Although he was the father of the Brahmin, he was a Brahmin himself, was lamenting the activities of his uh, son. And uh, he chastised his son also for acting like that. And his son actually realized after being chastised and being instructed by his father, he had acted in the wrong way, but it was too late. Maharaj Pariksha didn't act to... to, to uh, to try to counteract the curse and simply accepted it as the will of the Lord. And this led to the speaking of the Srimad Bhagavatam and, and the liberation of Maharaj Pariksit back to the spiritual world. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Uh, for the wonderful narrations of the stories. It's so sweet hearing them all over and again. Uh, over and again, again. It's, uh, it's so nice hearing it. The, the stories, especially, I'm so much um, happy to hear after the, uh, we've been hearing from the beginning of this chapter how Marat Parishit was caused, but remembering again what happened after Marat Parishit um, uh, was bitten by the snake. Hearing about the past times gives a lot of refreshing memory. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. So, um, devotees, um, if there are questions or comments, please kindly indicate by using the hand emoji or raising our hands directly um, to indicate a question. So, Maharaj, I have a question. In the beginning of the class, Maharaj, you, um, you mentioned about the three qualities required for the sustenance of any society, the Brahmanical culture, the protection of the cow, and the teaching of the um, teachings about the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And um, when we look at our today experience, the, according to Wikipedia, there are about 1.2 million Hindu, in, Hindus, followers of Vedic tradition. But we know that practically when we talk about uh, Brahmanical culture, it is almost very near. When we look at the population of Krishna consciousness, the devotees also globally, it is very small compared to the society at large. And probably this is the what is creating so much of the turmoil we find in the world. What can we do, Maharaj, um, to reduce this effect of Kali since some of these um, principles are not in place? Yeah, well, that's, that's what Prabhupada was thinking when he started the, the Krishna consciousness movement is that he first focused on um, 
wanting to create a class of brahmanas in the world who can have all the qualities that are needed for leadership and guide the rest of the society. That was Prabhupada's focus. And he kept that focus for many years. Only later, towards the end of his time, did he expand that principle into the other varnas. But the whole Krishna consciousness education was based on Brahminical education. And that is uh, knowing the scriptures, teaching the scriptures, worshiping the deity, teaching others how to worship the deity, accepting charitable gifts. In other words, becoming dependent on society for one's livelihood and also remunerating re others with charitable gifts. These are the six activities of the, Brahm the Brahminical culture. It's called Patan Patan Yajan Yajan Dana Pratigraha. And so we are doing that. We're preaching and we're also teaching uh, others to take up that mantle of preaching. And we're also worshiping the deity and teaching others how to do the same thing, of collecting charitable gifts and giving that charity back to expand the Krishna consciousness movement. So that are, these are the activities of the Brahminical culture. And this is where Prabhupada focused on in developing his society in terms of that aspect. He also mentioned and also uh, elaborated about cow protection and and the worship of the Supreme Personality of Godhead as the ultimate goal in life. But without leadership, you can't really do much with whatever ingredients you have. So you need that, that spiritual leadership. And that's meant to come. Now a Vaishnava is, is above a Brahmin. A Brahmin is within the secular, it's within the material range, but a Vaishnava is a person who is engaged in devotional service to the Lord. But Prabhupada wanted the Vaishnavas to also to exhibit the qualities of a Brahmin as the foundation for their execution of devotion to Krishna. And that will be very attractive to people in the world and will be the foundation for expanding Krishna consciousness. And all of these other principles, cow protection, worship of the Supreme Lord, would also automatically follow. So that's what our movement is about. Thank you, Maharaj, for the answer. Um, I have a follow-up question to that, because uh, yes, Shri Prabhupada has created this um, movement to, um, to bring about um, training Brahmana culture. But when we look at the Krishna consciousness movement after Shri Prabhupada's departure, uh, especially in the last two decades, it looks as if there is a kind of a, uh, a win, a kind of a declining in the attraction of devo uh, people to Krishna consciousness. Uh, maybe it's my perspective, I don't know, but looking at from Africa, pers uh, African perspectives, because when we joined the movement about three, three and a half decades ago, and the, the rate of the rate at which people joined the movement, um, and some other regions also, I think, um, which I have information. The rate that people are joining this ISCOM movement was in a kind of explosive manner. Apart from India, which I know that there is still a continuous increasing in development of um, attraction to Christian consciousness, it seemingly looks as if in other parts of the world, there is a kind of a decline in attraction to people joining Krishna consciousness as we experience it in the three, four decades in the past. So Mara, what could be the reason for this and what can we do? to mitigate this declining situation? Well, there, as you mentioned, it's different places in the world. Some are expanding and exploding. Like I'm in India right now, and I'm in with a very dynamic temple here in Pune. And there, we're doing programs with youth. We're doing programs with the congregation. We're doing programs with temple devotees. And there are, they're also opening up more preaching centers here. Uh, you go to Delhi, we have 15 temples just in in Delhi alone. You go to Russia, Russia's expanding, has been expanding in that area of the world too. But then you go to other areas of the world, you find what you mentioned, there is, there is no, because those areas of the world don't have proper leadership. And without proper leadership, 
there's no direction for the followers. So they might be able to do the programs and keep things going on a certain level, but to expand, they find it difficult to expand because it takes resources to expand. It takes manpower, it takes finances, it takes uh, education programs. So many of these uh, places who are not developing just don't have proper leadership or sufficient mm -hmm. leadership. It shouldn't be like that because we have a um, we have a uh, managerial body that's meant to keep the leadership intact. But for whatever reason, sometimes we get diverted. And one of the reasons I think we get diverted is because we look for material gain through the spiritual practice. Mm. You know, how much the money is coming on, it looks like the success we're having. The success is not by how much the money is coming on, but how much we're actually making devotees who are actually being, who are making advancement in spiritual life. So um, it's not about money, it's about culture, it's about education. It's about, it's about developing vision to expand the movement in different places. But a lot of the movement is being expanded outside of the temples through various preaching programs that are not so much inclined to temple worship. So you see, if you do a little study in many areas, there are devotees being made who so much do not adhere so much to temple worship or temple activities, but are practicing Krishna consciousness in their own homes. So that's the kind of the uncalculated number that is also developing there. So on the whole, if you look at a movement on the whole, it's expanding. Things are going because book distribution is strong in many areas of the world. And uh, preaching is going on in different programs also. Arinams are going on, programs are gone, but can't say it's happening everywhere. It's in, but in general, things are happening and programs are going on and expanding. So it depends where you are. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maharaj. Um, I'm, I'm very opportune and fortunate to be um, hosting this class today. And I'm um, um, happy that you're here to answer some of these questions that's been bothering our minds. But uh, before going for that, I am mother, uh, Supanishad, Sriya Supanishad is, and is up. So I'll give the opportunity to her to ask what question is here. Yeah. Sriya Supanishad. Please come here me. Maharaj. <laughs> Hari Hari Bo. <laughs> Hare Krishna. How are you going? <laughs> Long time Long no see. Uh, well, I'm happy to see that you're here. <laughs> I'm talking to you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I've, uh, I'll be coming to uh, Gita Nagari sometime in uh, May. Hurry, Bo! I know you live there. <laughs> no, I live in Ohio. But, you know, it's just like uh, living in Gitanagri because we're so close. We're not that far. You moved out of your place. And... No, no, I didn't move out of my place. I'm still in Cleveland, not Cleveland, Akron, Ohio. And uh, see, Maharaj, you haven't been a, you haven't been to Cleveland in Ohio in a long time. So oh, you okay. Yeah, yeah, you know. I just got a message. Somebody, somebody said, "Come to." <laughs> yes, yeah, you need to come. We're we're doing wonderful things. We're having quite a quite a nice uh, congregation developing now. So uh, you have to come, Maharaj. You. How is your health? health? How have you been? Well, I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I'm, I look like I'm not so alive, but other times I feel very alive. <laughs> well, you look fantastic. I just wanted to 
ask you how you were how you were doing because I haven't saw you, and uh, it was just a pleasure and a treat to just to to see you and to hear you. And I do have a question. Uh, my question is about the you you mentioned that the uh, the fall of the Brahmin uh, culture was because it was arranged pretty much. Did you say that that uh, the reason the um, Krishna arranged for uh, everything to fall because we were entering the age of Kali Yuga, and uh, he entered. He may he arranged for Srimad Bhagavatam to be spoken. But the fall of the Brahminical culture came with the activity of that one Brahmin boy, mm -hmm. and it's then and that snowballed from there. And that's what's that's what's being illustrated and mentioned in that purport. And Shamak is uh, lamenting that situation. He's a Brahmana. He's a superior position than his son. But he can see now that the Brahmanas will misuse their power. And that's the whole thing. They misuse their Brahminical power. Okay. So uh, where can I... You, you spoke a little bit about other things in that pastime that I wasn't aware of. So I guess we can go to the Srimad Bhagavatam and, and get all of the details. You're so thorough, Maharaj. Um, in describing the uh, demise of uh, Maharaj Prikshit, you go to the 12th canto, mm -hmm. sixth chapter is called the, uh, the Passing Away of Maharaj Prikshit. Okay. Thank you very much, Maharaj. I can't wait to see you in May. <laughs> Are you all? Uh, Maharaj, is there any way I can get your email address? Um, yeah. There can I a... have it, please? <laughs> uh, yeah, we can, we can arrange for you to give the email address. I'll give it to, uh, let me see, who do I know? That you can give it, I can give it to. Tell me somebody who I can give it to. Uh, let's see here. I know, I know you're very close to everyone. So <laughs> I'm not. Oh, what about Chandra? Chandra, he's always yeah. speaking highly of you. When when I haven't talked to him in a little bit, but can you give it to Chandra? It's already. He has it already. Just contact Chandra. He'll give it to you. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Nice to see you. And to see other great souls here. I'm looking at Jana Vatsal here. <laughs> She's here. What a surprise, Jana Vatsal. So good to see you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. <laughs> How's your family? What did he say? How's the family? Good, good. Thank you. Yeah. They're listening in. Good, good, good. Thank you for your class. Thank you for being there. We got Jagannath, Jagannath Pandit. He, your father is online right now. He's smiling big. <laughs> He's my, Maharaj. my old preaching buddy in jails. We used to go to jails together. Yeah, <laughs> three hour drive away. Yeah, I remember that was a, that was a quite a hike, a three and a half hour drive <laughs> from Kedanagri. We'd do anything in those days. <laughs> yeah, Maraj, uh it's so good to see you. I I do have one question. <clears throat> uh, I was thinking about. Uh, this pastime of Maharaj Pritchett and how uh, he, uh, even from from being in the womb, he was he was being uh, attacked, and then you know, perfect devotee, you know, the the example of leadership, and then this this curse happened. Now, of course, you know, he's a pure devotee and he's going to see 
everything that happens as Krishna's will. Mm -hmm. And even as uh, uh, trying to bring it to devotees today, like for myself, uh, it's the tendency is to think that, well, Krishna, I'm doing so much for you. You know, I'm giving my life. I'm making sacrifices. Why are you making these terrible things happen in my life? You know, the tendency is to, to think in that way. Um, so how do we uh, not counteract the curse, but counteract that mentality? <laughs> well, the mentality is obviously not seeing Krishna in calamities, because it says that for a devotee who is engaged in devotional service, obstacles are opportunities for greater spiritual advancement. And of course, we have the example right here. So a devotee has to see that, that um, as long as we still want to enjoy this material world, we will consider these reverses as being uh, something that is negative, something that's unwanted. Of course, we don't uh, welcome them, but when they do come, then we have to understand, well, why is Krishna putting me in this situation? He's teaching me something. He's helping me become detached from some material attachment. He's making me more dependent on his mercy. So this, this is a constant scenario that keeps uh, appearing throughout the whole history of uh, Vaishnav culture is that reverses are seen as opportunities for a greater spiritual advancement. Uh, we saw you saw that with your Guru Maharaj also. He took advantage of that reverse and used it to preach Krishna consciousness very powerful, write more books, and to uh, show the example of how to leave the world in such a way as one is welcoming the mercy of the Lord rather than resisting the mercy of the Lord. That's an extreme example, both with Maharaj Pariksit and with Bhakti Tirtha Swami. But on a smaller scale, when we uh, uh, have these reverses, apparently reverses, there's a meaning to it, there's a reason for it, and there's also something good in it. So uh, someone asked Srila Prabhupada, um, you, there's that old cliche, you hear it, and every cloud has a silver lining. I'm sure you heard that. Every cloud has a silver lining. So that statement was, was given to Srila Prabhupada for his comment. And Prabhupada said, no, every cloud has a silver lining only for the devotees, but not for the those who are not engaged in devotional service. Those who are engaged in not engaged in devotional service will simply see, will simply bring these difficulties or simply the reactions to their sinful activities. For a devotee, it's an opportunity to make advancement in Krishna consciousness. Just like you have uh, the example of Kadamba Kanana Maharaj. So he, he's been designated or diagnosed with. Uh, you know, terminal cancer. But he's not doing anything to try to counteract it. I mean, he did a little bit at the beginning, but then he realized, why waste time with this? Better to stay engaged nicely in devotional service, finish my life up in full devotional service and try to reach the spiritual world instead of running after this doctor, that doctor, and <laughs> specialist, and this this cure and that cure. And I spoke also to other senior devotees in relationship to him, and they, they also congratulated him for his, his uh, decision. So he's um, obviously, he's using this opportunity to go deeper into his own devotional service, stay fixed, and continue to preach Krishna consciousness. So, but for Thank us, you know. who get these smaller little obstacles, they're just teaching us something. That's it. something we need to learn, something we can use for the benefit. 
the Prabhupada said, and he quotes, he said, for a, a businessman, a good businessman, when the prices go up, he makes profit. When the prices go down, he makes profit. When we were in the lockdown for the coronavirus, many devotees became more Krishna conscious than ever. Many devotees started to preach even more so and spread Krishna consciousness even faster. Many devotees were able to do things that they couldn't do when they were actively engaged in Krishna consciousness. And they took the advantage of this, uh, what we say, seclusion to uh, expand their Krishna consciousness or fulfill their desires to uh, perform certain services. So that's an example of intelligence, how to use something that is apparently negative for something. And you can, do, you can only do that with Krishna consciousness. Because Krishna consciousness is, you know, it's a win-win game. You can't lose. If you accept it in the right way. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Mar Thank you so much, Maharaj, for that beautiful um, tips on how to deal with um, challenges in our devotional life. And that mm -hmm. leads me to my next question, Maharaj. Um, while you're answering the questions, like my last question, Maharaj, you mentioned, you said two things, and which, um, what is not working and what is working. What is not working is that maybe leadership gap is there in some of those areas where there are things. So we leave that aspect of not working things. Or well, you speak about something which is uh, interesting to me, that in some other places that are kind of a preaching that we have so many people reading Prabhupada's book, maybe following some of the principles of Christian consciousness, but they're not regular members of the movement. I do a lot of uh, interfaith um, preaching at different levels, like global levels, and then um, I've been worried. And then when you said this, it pricks my mind because um, one of the things that has been challenging for me is that most of these people at this different level, United Religious Initiative level, United Nations levels, all of these levels platform, I had the opportunity to preach there. And they take books. But most of these people at that level don't want to become regular devotees. But somehow they, they read the books, they take some parts of the Krishna consciousness principles. So could we say in the era of development of Krishna consciousness in the 10,000 years of golden age, are we saying that um, there would be this class of people who would maybe probably accept Krishna consciousness in part, and they are part of development of Krishna consciousness? Yeah. Yeah, Prabhupada also said, he said, don't expect everyone to become Krishna conscious. It's not possible. But even if we make people favorable, they read the books and chant sometimes, they're planting the seeds for future development. So it may not happen in this life, but at least in their next life, they'll get a good situation pick up from there. So there's, as long as we're preaching and expressing Krishna consciousness, there's always benefit. But don't expect, you know, everyone to become Krishna conscious. It's just not possible. Thank you very much for this. This is a very big service. <laughs> yeah. We, I think Shashidar had his hand up at the very beginning. We somehow forgot him. Is he he's still online? Shashidar, are you there? <laughs> well, Shashidar, he's there, and I can see his his emblem, but I don't see him. So anyway. <laughs> Yeah, he had, he's, he's he very beginning. Yeah, yeah. David Key, you're here. Okay, so, hi, Krishna Mara. So happy to see you. <laughs> you got the whole family here now. <laughs> <laughs> we're, only we're, we're, we're just missing Chintamani, huh? <laughs> Yeah. Hare Krishna. 
Jai Hari Krishna Maharaj, I'm here, but I just can't show my face. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. okay, where are you? Which one? Where's your little icon? Yeah, I'm in uh, John Avatsula's um, screen in the background. <laughs> oh, okay, good. You sound good. I hope your, your health is good now. Yes, it's more stable. Thank you so much. And the, the time you were here in 2015, when I had a cane and you um, um, were dancing and you uh, took my cane and you were doing a nice dance step, somehow you blessed my cane. And then soon after that, <laughs> I walk better. So thank you. <laughs> I, think, I think your cane blessed me also. <laughs> <laughs> your cane bless me that I don't have to carry a cane. <laughs> That's sweet. Yeah, I remember that. Yes, it was fun. <laughs> Thank you for blessing us always. Yeah, I look forward to meeting you all again soon. Yeah. Come to my uh, my uh, disciples meeting in New Vrindavan. It's in uh, Easter weekend in New Vrindavan. Oh. Seven. Yes, uh, April 7th to April 10th. And Bhuta Bhavan and Chitty Shakti are going to be there also giving classes. Wow. Yes, this is the pandemic, Marge. We haven't. We only traveled once. That was last summer for three days. Since my, you know, health is kind of, um, you know, vulnerable, we haven't traveled so much. But you know, thank you for those dates. We will, you know, put that down and, you know, see if we can come because that would be wonderful. Yeah, nice. We'll send you a flower airplane to get you there. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, <Happy birthday>. mercy! <laughs> You're so kind. Thank you for taking care of all of us all these yes. years. Thank you, Marge. Yeah, it's been really wonderful. Um, yeah, I'm getting a lot of association with the God family. It's been great. Mm, beautiful. We got Saha Dave there. And he's uh, he's yeah. It's, Saha Dave is son is way back from office. He's not able to show his face now. Saha Dave Prabhu. You're driving, huh? Yeah, it's, it's driving. <laughs> yes, Maharaj, I'm driving. But it's nice to see you and nice to hear you. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Hare. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. We're looking forward to meeting you in May. No, I'll, I hope to see you in April. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Okay. Okay, Shashi Dar is back. Hare Krishna. Yes. Yes, Please do you have a question. Mm -hmm. I'll to you. Thank you so much. Actually, I was having uh, mobile, so I couldn't. Uh, I just heard it and I came. I just, just switched over to other person. Okay. We still have Thank a question? You. Oh, no. Thank you so much for that. Okay. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please, um, I know it's very late in India, please, if you could give me your mercy. I wanted to have one question um, before you go, Maharaj. Sometimes um, it's somehow very difficult to bear the separation, disappearance of um, one spiritual master. How do one deal with this? Um, sometimes I couldn't just find a way to live. I just feel so helpless. I feel in separation from the spiritual master's departure. So at this kind of a moment, what is the best advice you will have for one to deal with this? Well, we write books about this subject. It's not a small thing. Um, one thing you should know that the spiritual master is still personally present with you based on how much you are absorbed in his, his mission and his instructions. He reasons ill who say that Vaishnavas die that when thou art living still in sound. Vaishnavas die to live and in living spread the holy name around. So a real a Vaishnava 
disappears from this level to continue with it, their service to the Lord somewhere else. But they never leave those who are dedicated to them. But it's up to us. Now we have to make a greater effort to stay in contact with them. And that means we have to get out of the neophyte position and come to the position of Madhyam Madhikari and actually take up the role of preaching. Then you will be able to, uh, you will not be able to feel that separation as being separation, but as an opportunity to serve, to serve in the mood of separation. Thank you, Maharaj. It's, um, I would say that uh, is 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 uh, maybe for the neophyte devotees that we have, it's a little bit difficult to, sometimes we read this in the scriptures, we hear it, maybe as we hear it more and more, then it will have an impression on this on the soul because um, um, sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's really, really very difficult, most especially when there are certain circumstances you find that it's difficult to find to 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 deal with the physical absence of the spiritual master. But um, I guess hearing and hearing it more and more from a personality like you will help us to be able to rise to that level where we can actually um, feel the presence of the spiritual master even in his absence. It, but it could be very difficult sometimes, Maharaj. Really, really difficult. But we'll yeah, keep trying. Because the spiritual master speaks through different avenues, different venues. So if you're connected with him through devotional service, you'll hear his voice in different through different situations, through different persons. And he'll be talking to you through these different uh, mediums. And if you're tuned to that, you'll be able to connect with him and actually uh, get further instructions and guidance. The spiritual master never leaves a disciple, but he apparently seems to leave. And that's Thank just that's, that's just to bring the neophyte devotees to a higher stage and to get rid of the the insincere devotees. That's why he leaves. The ones who are insincere will fall away. Those who are Sincere will make progress even after the spiritual master leaves. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Thank you. We have Hari Chakra there too. Oh my God, we're getting the whole Gita Nagri crew here. Hari Chakra Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you for the class. Thank you. Thank Good you. to see you. Good to see you, Maharaj. <laughs> we hope to see you in Gita Nagri, Maharaj. All right, but I'll invite you first to New Vrindavan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. <laughs> If you, if you if you if you promise us that you are going to give us your transcendental dancing, then we are in. <laughs> oh, well, you know, there's nobody who can dance like Hari Chakra. <laughs> <laughs> Maharaj, Maharaj, you are you are the you are the supreme dancer. Right? <laughs> I learned some I learned some new dance movements. I can't call them dance steps. They're not dance steps, they're dance movements. <laughs> yeah, I I try to somehow or other follow in your footsteps, but I wasn't able to keep up. <laughs> Thank you very much, Maharaj, for being with us. We really, really, yeah, very yeah. nice to see everyone. Boy, it's been a wonderful uh, discussion here. So many great souls are here. Yeah. So, does anybody has any last question before Maharaj leaves? 
it's getting late in India. Sri Devi, you got a question or you just, you always got a question. <laughs> <laughs> my dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to His Holiness Bhakti Tita Maharaj. You have transported me back to Gita Nagari Guru Maharaj by giving me association <laughs> of all these wonderful, wonderful, wonderful devotees of Bhakti Tita Maharaj. So I'm just smiling from year to year, just seeing all my wonderful Shiksha God family here. I have no question except will they all come to uh, <laughs> West Virginia and join us and uh, give us their ecstatic association. That's the only question I have. Hey, it's your job to make sure they come. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Guru Maharaj. <laughs> I cannot help but remember Bhakti Dita Maharaj and his wonderful dancing and how the whole floor was like electrified with all of his disciples, you know, jumping up and down and dancing in Kirtan. It was just amazing spiritual energy, just amazing. Yeah. Lokanath Swami Maharaj tells the story of how we were all in New Vrindavan. It was the year 2000, I think. And Lokanath Swami was meant to, it was a festival. And, uh, so he was leading the, the Mongol Arti, and Bhakti Tirtha Swami was there, and I was there, Radha Swami was there. All it was a lot of us were there. And the people had come everywhere for the festival. And towards the middle of the kirtan, right, right after the, uh, the guru glorification, Bhakti Tirtha Swami started to get everybody going. And he started to chant. <laughs> And then we all got slowly into the into the mood, and then finally it kept going. And so his dancing towards the end of Mangalarti became so enticing, so attractive, that Loganath Swami didn't stop leading the kirtan. And so we danced through Tulsi Arti, we danced through the entire Japa period, we danced through Guru Puja, we danced through Srimad Bhagavatam class. <laughs> we're still going we're like flying all around the room and we, you know we have big you know the uh, new vrindavan temple room is i think we covered every inch of the space <laughs> yeah. and then some devotees left for lunch, breakfast but a few of us kept going <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was, that was amazing, Kirtan. And Mara just danced through the whole thing. <laughs> and we couldn't stop because if we were stop, if we ever tried to stop, it wouldn't work. I mean, the energy <laughs> was so, so strong. Yeah. And an amazing thing about that Kirtan, and I can remember, I didn't get tired. <laughs> yeah, interesting. It was just so blissful. Hi, Bo Maharaj. This is the season of bringing joy. Look what you just did. You just brought all that joy to us. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Hi, Bo. <laughs> Sri Yashupanishad. Yeah, those of you who don't know it, Sri Yashupanishad was a schoolmate of Bhakti Tirtha Swami. They went to school together. Yeah. So, uh... Mercy. Mercy, mercy. How do you go? <laughs> We're only missing Jambavati. Where's she going? She's not here. <laughs> we need to get Jambavati on. Mara <laughs> Jambavati is here. Jambavati is here? No. Yeah, I saw her early. I don't know if she left, but she was here. Oh, really? Yes. And Yashoda Mai. No, Yashoda Mai has not been here today, no. Well, we did pretty good. We got the whole yeah. thing of Jagannath Pandit here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so, so much, my right. We're so, so blessed to have you. I'm just happy to be here with all the devotees. Thank you for organizing this program. Thank you, Maharaj. Tom is our life. 
just discussing and hearing about Srimad Bhagavatam, and we, we won't have to touch this material energy. Thank you so much, Mother. Bye, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So, um, if there are no other questions or any comment from any devotees, I think we'll allow Maharaj to go so that we can. But before we go, um, as our usual routine here, we we'll request all of the devotees to please kindly all unmute themselves and then let us loudly chant the loudest of Hare Krishna Mahamantra to appreciate Maharaj for giving us this life. Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Hare Rama Hare Rama Hare 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 Thank you very much, Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.